All right, let's get underway. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. Uh, just let me make a couple of comments before we start the seminar. One of the most fundamental principles of scientific research is that no theory is ever proven to be correct. All we can ever say is that a particular theory is consistent with all the relevant data we can find. We discard previously accepted theory whenever we can gather sufficient data that are more compatible with an alternative theory. Centuries ago, the popular consensus was that the earth was flat, but when sufficient information had accumulated, this theory was able to be falsified and replaced with the theory that the earth is round. That's progress of science. My layman's impression is that climate is one of the most complex systems imaginable. So I cringe when anybody suggests that we know just about all we need to know about climate change. The paper on which today's presentation is based aims to bring available evidence to bear on what seems to be widely accepted climate change theory. How well do historical data on variables such as CO2 levels, global temperatures, sea levels, and the frequency of extreme weather events fit with the assumed relationships be, um, between them, which are built into the climate change models. This issue is important for economists and others who work on climate change. The pressure that is being brought to bear on policymakers in Australia and elsewhere is resulting in the introduction of extraordinarily costly policies based on the presumed need to save mankind from itself by cutting back on carbon emissions. But what if the relationship between CO2 levels and global temperatures is more correlation than causation? And what if the relationship is weak when observed over long periods? The implication would be that we are imposing these costs on ourselves for little and perhaps no benefit. With these preliminary thoughts in mind, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Howard Brady. Most of you will already have a copy of his brief bio, so I won't take up more time by going through this, other than to note that he is, amongst other things, an accredited reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, for its forthcoming report, which is due next year. Howard has agreed to speak for about an hour, leaving, with, leaving us with roughly half an hour at the end for questions and comments. If people wish to ask short questions of clarification along the way, they can do so by hitting the chat icon in the Zoom screen and writing them down. I'll try to track this uh, chat room and uh, refer such questions onto Howard as we go through but my preference is to avoid engaging in matters of debate during the presentation and leaving that until the end. I think that's fairest to the presenter. So now, Howard, it's over to you. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, thank you very, very much, everyone who has decided to listen to this talk. I've received support from all over the world, from Holland, from Canada, from Ireland, from the United States and from professors at other Australian universities. I learned my geological trade in Antarctica. In some areas, we had nothing to go on. It was exciting to start from scratch without any preconceived ideas. We were confronted with climate change and many features we studied were formed about 15 million years ago when Antarctica was much, much warmer than today. My CV is available, there's no need to go through that. But I've been working on climate since 2005, when I was an honorary associate at the School of Bi Biological Sciences, Macquarie University. As a result of that research, there's a book called Mirrors and Mazes, a climate debate. And currently my son Dominic and I are working on a YouTube channel called The Climate Compendium. We are trying to study the development of scientific ideas that eventually led to modern climate science. We're studying individuals, their personalities, who they talked to, what they said, where they got their ideas from. It's very fascinating to learn about people because at the end of the day, 
all our thinking comes from real people. Um, I want to start this seminar by making an observation that modern climate science is riddled with simplistic arguments. Just wait a minute, we'll get this right. There's a lot of populist climate logic out there. Unfortunately, it's even in professional reports. And climate reports have significant economical consequences. And that's why what I'm saying should be of interest to the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. But now, I want to start with an example that's close to my heart because I lived with this, I saw it. it to some extent, it was very sad and also very amusing. Billions of dollars were taken off property values when the Snowy Mountains Engineering Corporation gave a report to the Shoalhaven City Council around 2008, 2009. It wasn't SMEC's fault that they were asked to work out what would happen if sea level went up 90 centimetres, but it was the logic in their report that was really, really bad. This is a, a slide, a photo of Penguin Head, east of Nara. What a lovely headland. And the only trouble with it is that the headland is tilted above sea level. The, all the, the rock platform, which is normally formed between high metres above sea level, because the whole of the Sydney Basin is tilted inland. The Sydney Basin are all these sandstones from a big river system like the Nile a couple of hundred million years ago in the Triassic. But since that time, there's been very gentle uplift of the edge. If you go to Bondi and look to the north to the rock platform, it's over two metres above sea level. So that basically, if sea level goes up 90 centimetres, which Smek was asked to talk about, this rock platform protects the cliff anyhow because it's 1.8 metres above sea level. I had it surveyed by the chief surveyor of the Shellhaven City Council. He brought out all their expensive equipment. The photo you can see is near high tide, and you can see that waves are flat out reaching the cliff, and they do in a storm, but that's about it. One of my friends who was a, a double medalist at an Olympic team, he represented Australian two Olympic sports, lived on this peninsula. He was been growing geraniums at the bottom of this cliff for 40 years. When I reported to the council on this and said, look, this is wrong. You've got very big legal problems. You can be sued. You're devaluing properties that are protected from rising sea level. I was asked to report on beaches. When I looked at beaches, I said, well, I'm not a beach geologist, but I'm a field geologist. So what I did was I got aerial photographs from the council that have been taken every year of the New South Wales coast from 1948 to 2008. Here at Kalbara Beach, on the left, you can see an aerial photograph taken in, two, uh, I think, 1949. Sorry. Now, in, you can see there that uh, there's a lot of sand. The, the near side properties have got a lot of sand. 2008, you can see how much the vegetation has grown. Now, this was saying that this vegetation is growing forward as a sand trap. Uh, it's catching sand. Maybe the beaches are growing forward. Here we got, now to get away from where there's any people, this is Kinghorn Point, south of Kalbara. You can see here, this foredune has been trapping so much vegetation. I uh, sorry, it's got so much vegetation, it's trapped sand and it's been advancing seaward. So that even though seaward, the sea level is going up, the beach is advancing seaward. And then if there's a storm surge, that foredune gets wrecked, the sea comes in, and then it starts growing again. So SMEC, the, the report was written by engineers. And this is typical of engineers. Some of them are very arrogant. They think they know climate change. They don't talk to geologists. If they spoke to geologists here, they would have at least got a few things right, and they didn't. I, the same thing happened. I want to switch now because that's a simple point I'm making about what's happened in Australia at, at one council. But with regard to the mid-Pacific islands, we're all told how they're going to be flooded. And on the right, you can see a map. Uh, it was made 
by the United Nations in 2005 and it predicted 15 million climate refugees by 2015. Well, if you look at the map, the purple are increasing storms, the yellow is droughts, but all those little blue dots, they are places that are going to be flooded to create all these climate refugees. Well, work by Professor Kench uh, at the University of Auckland and Dr. Webb, who's employed by the United Nations for what is called the Tuvalu Inundation Project, shows that 73 of islands have grown in size uh, since 1980. Well, that's a different dynamic, isn't it? Because nature's very dynamic. The processes are complex. You just can't say carbon dioxide going up, sea level going up, sea level going up, shore retreat. It's, it's a very complex system. And just for fun, I took a very little atoll that's too small for anyone to live on. And over 20 odd years, uh, it was in the yellow area. Then it grew to the Northwest to blue. And at the moment, it's back at the red thing. These are very dynamic processes. So a lot of these islands are growing in some place and losing a bit of land in another. But on the whole, as I said, 73 have been growing in size in the last 40 years. Now, once I looked at all of these type of problems, then it was necessary to look at sea because from the Shoalhaven, it looked if sea level wasn't accelerating very much. It was maybe going up, but in a pretty gentle fashion. So, and if the sea level is still going up in a gentle fashion, something's amiss with all the other climate models and their projections. Because if sea level is going up in a gentle way, where is the coming climate catastrophe? Now, when the first IPCC meeting occurred in 1990, the Sea Level Committee um, was chaired by Professor Warwick, I think from the University of uh, East Anglia, and uh, another professor from, I think, Utrecht, they had available to them a tide gauge database for tide gauges all over the world, thousands of tide gauges. And this tide gauge database is kept at the Joseph Proudman building um, in Liverpool, England. And uh, that's on the mercy, it's, it's, it's world famous. You can, every tide gauge has got a number, ask for the number, put in the number, and you'll see the the tide gauge data for however long that tide gauge has been operating. So when they looked at all this data, they saw that even though the models said that sea level was accelerating or should accelerate it, they couldn't find any acceleration whatsoever. So what they saw was the diagram on the left, a steady ramp. They didn't see the curved ramp on the right. Now the same happened in the IPC meeting in 1995. The same happened in the meeting in 19, sorry, in 2001. But just to show you, by the way, this is some of the data these people were seeing. Fort Denison, you've got Battery in New York. On the right, I've put there all the New Zealand gauges and you can see all of them. It's sort of a gentle slope up with no any acceleration. However, in 2007, when the IPC met, they had now data from a satellite system that had started, I think, in 1992. There was Topex Poseidon, Jason 1, and I think by that time they were up to Jason 2. We're up to Jason 4 at the moment. Well, the satellite was saying sea level was going up to 30 centimetres per century. That's twice the tide gauges. Oh, and they said, wow, we found acceleration. So we've got a steady rise in an, to all through the 20th century to the 90s, and bang, we've got acceleration. It never occurred to them they were looking at changing methods. And at that meeting, they never really discussed why there was such a radical difference between tide gauge data and satellite data. There was some excuse the tide gauge data was simply local and the satellite data was the general ocean. But when you've got thousands and thousands of tide gauges all saying the same thing, you obviously have a link to the general ocean. On the left in this diagram, you've got the Jason 3 satellite. 
That's the second last one that's up. You can see that it talks to other satellites. Uh, then it sends messages down to the sea. And then it compares its measurements to a theoretical shape of the Earth called a terrestrial geoid. Anyhow, in 2011, the US Army Corps of Engineers through Professor Houston said, wait a minute, we think there's telemetry problems with these satellites. The readings are twice the tide gauges and that's not possible. Something is seriously wrong. And then next year in 2012, the NASA engineers who designed the satellite said, we do have a problem with them. You see, when they design the satellite, they don't run it. They give it out in contract to someone and it's in contract to the University of Colorado. So what the NASA satellite said, look, this satellite system is not accurate enough. We need to put up a, a satellite at a higher orbit, say two and a half thousand K instead of 1300 K. We want a satellite that's got absolutely no moving parts at all. And we think we can get down to a millimeter type accuracy. And once that's done, the JSON satellites can correct their uh, telemetry systems. And so can the polar ice satellites who have all these diverse readings for how much ice is disappearing on the polar regions. However, unfortunately, that has never happened. That satellite, which they needed a couple hundred million for it, that was never forthcoming. But if it did, I think a lot of problems would be solved because if we can prove that there has been no, there's still no acceleration of sea level, then sea level is so vital in those models. So that brings up straight away, well, what is this carbon dioxide temperature link? How's it affecting sea level? How's it affecting world temperatures? Because the sea level forecasts depend on models. Well, how good is the link? And then the question comes up, when you look at some of the data I'm going to show you, has carbon dioxide lost its puff? Has it done whatever it can do in absorbing some uh, radiation that's been emitted from the earth at certain wavelengths? And that's all it can do. It's very choosy. All of these gases are choosy. Well, you know, has it lost its puff? How did, how did we get there? So in order to look at this, um, as I said earlier in my introduction, we're very interested looking at individuals that worked out various things that have, have been the pillars of climate science. And one of the first people was Jean-Baptiste de Fourier. And around the 1820s, he had a look at this problem uh, of the atmosphere uh, getting heat radiated from the earth. He was orphaned at the age of eight, brought up by the Benedictines. By the age of 15, he'd conquered all the uh, uh, textbooks at the uh, Paris University on mathematics. By 18, he was lecturing on mathematics at a military academy. But he eventually brought out a book on the mathematics of heat transfer and solids by conduction. And you've probably heard if you're a mathematician of the Fourier transforms. But when he looked at the atmosphere, he said, if we didn't have this atmosphere, we'd be losing heat to space. Any planet without the atmosphere is going to be freezing at, freezing at night. So our atmosphere is a very precious commodity. But Fourier never worked out what was actually happening in the atmosphere. A few years later, there was an Irish physicist who worked the whole thing out. He's right. His work, his work was very accurate. It still stands the test of time. Tyndall was an Irishman. As a young man, he went to England, worked as a surveyor. Then he got a job teaching maths at a Quaker school near Portsmouth. He went to Germany. Uh, the German universities were famous at that time for experimental science. You, you became a scientist by experimenting. Uh, he worked under Bunsen, of Bunsen burner fame. And when he came back to England, Faraday heard one of his talks and said, look, uh, how about taking up a position at the Royal Institute in London? Uh, you can do whatever you like, but every month you've got to give a public lecture on science to the public. Well, Tyndall was in his element. And a few, he was working mainly on magnetism, but then he, he heard about this idea about the atmosphere and then he had his experiment where he put different gases in this tube of tin to see which ones absorbed long wave radiation coming from on the right, a uh, uh, an iron chamber with boiling water in it. His biggest problem was 
how does he put a gas in a tube and seal it in so the seal doesn't stop the heat just staying in there? Uh, he found out that if he put rock, uh, slivers of rock uh, salt at the ends of the tube, heat would, would leave because rock salt is a great um, conveyor of heat. And that's how he put different things in the tube. I won't go into it because that's a lecture in itself. But what he found out was that the main gases in the atmosphere didn't do anything, oxygen and nitrogen, nothing at all. It was the little gases that did things, but the main one was water vapor. And he said, water vapor was king. He said, without water vapor, we would still freeze. And all these other gases, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, very minor players. His work was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he was an incredibly interesting guy. Every summer he would disappear and take a break. And he was one of Europe's top mountain climbers. He failed to be one of the first up the Matterhorn, but he and two Austrians were the first to climb the Weisenhorn. We're getting after Tyndall, the main problem for the next 50 years in that 19th century was how could the climate change so much if there's been an ice age? And the idea of ice age was worked out by Louis Agassiz, a, a Swiss scientist. He did botany and medicine in Germany. Then he wrote books on fossil fish. And when he, ran the, when he went around looking at fossil fish in rocks, he saw all these boulders everywhere. He even went to Brazil. He didn't see an ice age in Brazil, but he went to Brazil chasing fossil fish, fossils. Anyhow, he went to England and he went to Scotland with William Buckland, who became the Anglican Dean of Westminster. And Buckland thought that these boulders were from the biblical flood. And then Buckland changed his mind and said, no, I agree with you, there's been an ice age. So the ice age problem was critical. And then the Ice Age was problem was tried to be solved by Cervantes Arrhenius around 1898, 1899. But Arrhenius got it all wrong, but he's still hailed as a hero because he thought carbon dioxide going up would keep the world warm and solve us from an Ice Age. But his concept of an Ice Age came from looking at all the limestone rocks around Europe. And he said, wait a minute, uh, my PhD thesis was on salts dissolving in water and uh, the iron separating out as positive and negative things. And limestone's deposited from the ocean. So at the time, when this limestone was deposited in huge amounts, there must have been a lot of carbonate ions and carb uh, calcium ions in the water. And that's impossible unless you've got equivalently high carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. That was Henry's law, worked out by William Henry in 1803. The only trouble was his idea of an ice age, uh, his idea, sorry, of high carbon dioxide levels, he said that's causing a hot period. So he thought this Ordovician period where these limestones were formed was hot because the carbon dioxide levels were high. What he didn't know was at that time the carbon dioxide levels were 10 times that of today and there was an ice age. And he also didn't know at the time of the dinosaurs there was another ice age with carbon dioxide levels about 1,500 parts per million, about five times today. He got it horribly wrong, but he still thought about it as a hero. The last person I want to talk about in this survey of some individuals was Guy Callender, a brilliant steam physicist. His father was a steam physicist. He lectured in Canada where he was born, but he came back to... To, to London, and they tinkered with train engines because steam was the key in those days. How good can we make a steam engine? And uh, Calendar lost an eye when he was five because his little brother put a pin in his eye, but he always had a hobby of looking at weather. And as he got older, he started to collect uh, temperature records from the Smithsonian, from central England, and all from Europe, particularly Switzerland. And he said, and he was the first person to prove that between the 1890s and the 1930s, the world warmed. And he said, the only thing going up has been carbon dioxide from the, uh, the uh, burning of coal. And he said, no, we're going to warm because coal burnt, CO2 is in the atmosphere. He even said, oh, anyone who doesn't believe me is arrogant. They've got to be humble enough to listen to me. 
He said, some people are jealous because I got the idea first. But the trouble was that after the Second World War, England had a very cold period, some of the coldest winters till the early 1700s. And the CIA was warning the American president of an impending ice age. So he got it all wrong because when he was studying, CO2 was going up and so was temperature. They were going up in tandem. But when two things occur together, that doesn't necessarily mean causality. When I leave the calendar, I'd like to mention one brilliant thing he did. During the Second World War, he helped design a system on a couple of runaways in England with big pipes that injected, that injected oil into the air and the, the, from the fires there, they dispersed the fog at night. Thousands of lives were saved. So when bombers came back from Germany, they had somewhere to land because if there was a fog and uh, there was a fog everywhere, they just have to crash land on the countryside and, and would be killed. Let's now go to this carbon dioxide temperature link in detail. This graph is also being produced by the Hadley Centre in Britain, it's not done by some climate skeptic. And we can see a warming between 1920 and 1940. We can see another warming between 1970 and 2000. And those lines are parallel, the, the warming gradients are around the same, 0.16 Celsius per decade. But wait a minute, the CO2 going up between 70 and 2000, that's three times higher than the other. Well, how come we can have the same temperature gradient and yet the gradients of CO2 rise are very, very different. And then if you look between 1940 and 70, then we've got that period I said where the CIA was warning the American president of an ice age and temperatures were going down. So that graph shows a very, very weak link between carbon dioxide levels and temperature. This here, this diagram here that you can see, this is a 500 million year exam. Back here around 450 million years, you can see that the bottom, you can see that big drop in the, in the light gray line, that's an ice age. Above it at A, you can see these incredibly high carbon dioxide levels. An ice age with carbon dioxide levels over 10 times today. At B, we've got the Permian Ice Age, we've got low CO2 levels and, and low temperatures. C, we've got another ice age in the age of the dinosaurs, but carbon dioxide levels are around 2000 parts per million. And then from about 100 million years onward, we've got this gradual decrease in carbon dioxide levels um, and in temperatures. So, Oh, sorry, the carbon dioxide levels take a while for a while, but then they, they really drop off. So this link is very, bad, very, very poor. And we start to say, well, wait a minute, carbon dioxide level at some low level, say a couple hundred parts per million, absorbs radiation. But after that, even if you increase it, it's done its dash. It's probably absorbed most of the long wave radiation from the earth that it can. Now this diagram is one of the most important diagrams of this whole seminar. Uh, it was sent to me by Professor Will Happer. Happer was on the Security Council of the United States last year. And uh, he's one of the world's top physicists working on lasers, gaseous lasers. And um, he's been in the Trump. This diagram, the blue, that's the long wave radiation coming from the earth if there was no atmosphere. The black line is what's actually happening at the moment. The green, you can see that if CO2 wasn't in the atmosphere, that little gap wouldn't be there. So CO2's helped to produce that gap. But the critical thing in this whole diagram is the red. The red is what would happen if we doubled CO2 to 800 parts per million versus 400 parts per million at the moment, or 410, whatever it is today. There's hardly any difference. As Happy said to me, the difference is only a couple of watts. So in other words, all this doubling of CO2 and all this panic about having to reduce emissions, well, if CO2 goes up, it's not going to cause much more warming. The warming's got to be related to something else. And if we reduce emissions, we're not going to achieve anything. We're just wasting billions of dollars. So leaving this carbon dioxide temperature link for a moment, we'll come back to it. 
There's a lot of other myths in the climate debate. What about rising carbon dioxide and storms? Every time there's a storm, some idiot of a politician says this is a sign of global warming. But the fact is, storms are milder in warmer periods and worse in cold periods. So a drop in mid-latitude storm frequency is a more proof of warming than the opposite. It, it proves, doesn't disprove global warming. Now, in this slide, you can see on the top left, hurricanes hitting the United States since 1850. There's no relation with CO2. Behind and below that, Australian cyclones. Up on the top right, tornadoes. Oh, there, look at that big uh, spike. That was 1974. There was a big system that came over from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. And when it rolled over the uh, Rockies and descended, because the Earth spins at different speeds at different latitudes, there was tornadoes all the way from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. And on the bottom right, you've got the wind in the tropics every six hours since 1972. There's no correlation at all. The other thing is when you get a storm surge, like there was a little one north of Sydney uh, about last year, I think, people say that's sea level rise, but every storm surge is a low pressure system, a very violent storm, and the low pressure system causes a sea level rise, and the system is so violent it pushes water ahead of itself. The worst storm surge in Australian history was at Bathurst Bay in 1890, 1880, sorry, 99. The storm surge was 12 metres. It was a pearling settlement. Most of the people there were killed, 300 were drowned. Shark bodies were found 40 kilometres up creeks. Uh, the wind was well over 200 k an hour. It was one of the largest pressure drops ever noted in the Southern Hemisphere. Just to show you a storm surge, on the left is a photo of the storm surge in um, Jarvis Bay, 1974. There are all the uh, Navy cadets from the opposite school helping out at Kalala Beach. And on the right, there's a storm surge in 1986. That one knocked out the forge in totally and started to eat at the main dune. And here in the 1950s, some developer wouldn't be allowed today, just bulldozed the top of the dunes and they built all these fibro cottages and now they've got some more there. Looking at storms in the past, uh, Professor Lamb, who wrote a great book on storms of the past, and he's, he founded the Hadley Centre in England, he thought the storms were worse in ice ages. One of the great storms was the great storm of 1703. The storm was so violent, about 700 ships were just tore off their moorings in the Thames and the Western Thames was a pile of wood. Over a thousand sailors were, died on the Goodwin Sands just off the mouth of the Thames. Over uh, in Wales, uh, about 30 ships were lost and their five men of war escorts all lost. One British Admiral, he was lucky, his ship was blown all the way to Sweden and he survived. You can see on the right here, a, uh, a report at the time about the storm and they even quote the Bible uh, the book of Nahum, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storms. And, the cloud. and Daniel Defoe wrote the next year a book on the storm. Now, we've also got these unprecedented arguments. You heard them all the time. Unprecedented CO2 levels, unprecedented loss of ice in the Arctic, unprecedented loss of glaciers or retreating in the Greenland or the Antarctic. It's the hottest for a thousand years. Wow, wow, wow. Well, let's have a quick look at these things. Carbon dioxide, yeah. We are the highest for not just a couple of thousand years, I think for many millions of years. But if, if we're even you know, higher than say 50 million years ago, that's only a 70th of geological time. For most of geological time, carbon dioxide levels were much higher than this. So, I don't think that's much of an argument at all. The Arctic being a free of ice. The Arctic, by the way, this Arctic Ocean is twice as Australia. Sometimes when you look at a little globe, you think it's a small area, it's not. But 
now the geological historians taking cores in the Arctic are finding that there are many times 8,000 years ago when there was no uh, pack ice in the Arctic in winter. Right through the year it was ice free. So, well, wait a minute. Is that unprecedented then? And even if it became ice free again and we could get through, big deal. Global ice retreat. What about ice retreat in Greenland? The, the greatest Greenland glacier, the Jakobshaven, the fastest glacier in the world, it's retreated a lot. 30 k's of retreat between 1851 and 2003. Then it stopped a while, then it retreated severely, and today, the last three years, it's growing again. But Geologists have now shown, drilling some old lake sediments in North Greenland, 4,000 years ago, uh, the, after the last ice age finished, the warm period called the Holocene Thermal Maximum, the ice sheet in Greenland was much, much smaller than today. That wasn't a catastrophe for the Earth. Our, the ice sheet today is nowhere as small as it was 8,000 years ago. So what is unprecedented? If we look at West Antarctica, Al Gore spoke about these glaciers. The Canary and the coal mine, a coal mine showing catastrophe that's coming. But the Pine Island Glacier and the Thwaites, which are the main ones they talk about, again, the, the, uh, the British Antarctic Survey has shown that they retreated more 8,000 years ago. So again, what is unprecedented? And what about the iceberg story? Oh dear. Some iceberg, the picture's there, and some reporter says, oh, what is this still? Well, there are, the ocean covers over 70% of the surface of the globe. To raise sea level one metre, you need a glacier that goes from Sydney to Perth, that's 3,600 K, it's 100 K wide and one K deep. That huge, Glacier will only give you one metre of sea level rise. If you melt the whole Antarctic ice cap, you'd get nearly 60 metres of sea level rise. If you melt all the Greenland ice cap, you'd get about six. But there's so much ice there, it's mind blowing that people don't have the ice follow metrics to understand the situation. And then I'd have to mention in this talk, the hockey stick of Michael Mann. Around 1999, using tree rings and pretty dodgy graphs. He showed that this medieval warm period was a local event in the Northern Hemisphere and really wasn't global at all. And that we, uh, we were the hottest for over a thousand years, even 2000. He superimposed temperature records from thermometers over records from tree rings to try to marry the two. It was pretty dodgy, but the problem was there wasn't much evidence at the time in the Southern Hemisphere because the medieval warm period, you can see from say 50 North to 70 North, there's a lot of towns and cities. You can go to Estonia and Latvia and look at the port records. In the medieval warm period, the ports were open for longer. And, and if you go to Japan uh, and look at the, the monks and their record of the date that the cherry blossom started, well, when it was warm, they started a lot earlier. But 50 south to 70 south, you're in the ocean. So what I've done on the right, you've got this globe, and I've put England between Australia and Antarctica, where it would be if it was in the Southern Hemisphere. I received an email from an Englishman to say, Dr. Brady, that diagram is so wrong, you should have turned England upside down. And I totally agree with him, I should have, but uh, that was a mistake, but I made the point. What's happened in recent times is that the Americans out of Lamont Doherty Observatory in New York have looked at cores in the Southern Ocean and we can use isotopes of fossils that lived on the bottom of the ocean and come up with the ocean temperatures at the time. Now that ocean temperature is due to pack ice on the surface of the ocean. It reflects the surface ocean temperature because when pack ice in the Antarctic freezes, it's less salty and so the water underneath is saltier and sinks. And that forms the Antarctic bottom water. Then that migrates to so much of it formed that over the last 10 or 15 million years, the last, the bottom one, the Antarctic bottom water past the equator. So if we look at the, 
the temperature record we get from fossils of living on that floor of the ocean and we can date them, gosh, the medieval warm period, the ocean water was about 0.65 warmer than today. And that's a huge amount in the Southern Ocean. It was warmer in the Northern Hemisphere too. So that we've got a medieval warm period in the Southern Hemisphere and Michael Mann's hockey stick uh, has died a, a scientific death. This graph is very interesting. We have a big problem. When people tell you that we are warming and we have been, they take the temperature records, the databases say in America or Australia or whatever, but our databases are distorted because there's more recording stations in the cities than in the country. And the worst, many countries, they homogenize the records by averaging a temperature, say, from here to there. So we average a temperature, say, from an airfield near Ipswich with Birdsville out in Western Queensland. Now, this is ridiculous. So if we really want to estimate global warming, we really cannot take urban temperatures because at night time, thousands and thousands of square kilometres of bitumen and concrete that have absorbed heat during the way are giving that back out. So the nighttime temperatures are much warmer than the rural temperatures. If you want to get an objective view of what the warming has been in the last century, we've got to take rural temperatures. Here is graphs prepared by Willie Seen from the Smithsonian Institute and two Irish statisticians, the Connolly brothers. They're comparing 126 rural stations in China and another 108 stations in urban China from about 1950 onwards. Basically, the warming in rural China was about 0.02 Celsius or 0.025 Celsius per decade. In rural China, in urban China, it was 0.119, four times more. They're only small figures, but if you then reduce the amount of global warming in the 20th century, and then look at changes in solar radiance, then you're, you're bringing back our temperature changes to changes in the sun. Whereas if we take the urban temperature record, then we say it's impossible, the sun can't be doing this, it's got to be humans. But it's humans that are distorting the temperature record because we're taking the urban temperature records and we're not taking simply rural temperature records. So that brings me, of course, to cosmic and the weather, because we need, when you look at that stuff from Willie Soon, to rediscover the sun. Now, there are some changes in the sun's distance to the Earth, but very minor. Um, Jupiter and Saturn cause the sun to wobble through about one solar diameter. The cycles are nearly 180 years. And that was very well described by Fairbridge, a great Australian geologist who worked mainly in New York. We've also got the Russians and they've been very interested in the sun and sunspots. But on the International Space Station, on the bottom left, we've got this thing called the solar limbograph. The sun pulses in size like a beating heart. And basically what they're saying that if the sun's diameter changed by a couple of hundred k's, the surface can change by a billion square k's. And the heat giving out by our body is related also to its surface area. So that there can be changes in the sun's radiation over short periods of time. Whereas in modern climate science, I'm not saying, oh no, the changes in the sun, yeah, they've occurred, but they occur over hundreds of thousands of years. But more importantly, and probably to the cutting to the chase even more, when you look at sunspot data, history is telling us something very important. There was a period between about 1640 and 1715, there was no sunspots on the sun and it was cold. There was another period from 1795 to 1825, no sunspots, it was cold again. And when you try to relate the sunspot numbers to what's been happening today, and now our sunspot numbers are decreasing, some people are saying, oh, wait a minute, if this happens again and we end up with no sunspots for 10 or 15 years, are we going to head back to a a solar minimum, like in a little ice age. Between the sunspot data, 
solar irradiance and the heat that we're getting on Earth. This is telling because going back to that rural temperature data from uh, Willie Soon at the Smithsonian, if we now superimpose estimates of solar irradiance over rural China temperature records and rural United States temperature records and rural Ireland temperature records, we've got Irish statisticians, so they have to do Ireland, they correspond. So it looks as if the warming today, provided we accept that we can only estimate it by ruling, ru using rural temperatures, not urban, that really fits in with changes in the sun. Finally, in regard to the sun and the solar system, there's an incredible story. And um, during writing this paper, one of the men behind us actually emailed me from Ottawa. Jan Weiser did his PhD thesis on isotopes at ANU, 1970s. He escaped, when the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, he fled with his wife and one small child. John Lovering, who was chairman at ANU, offered him a scholarship to do a PhD. He came out. In the meantime, John was offered the chair in Melbourne and went there, but he stayed at ANU. Later, he went back to Germany and Canada where he's, he's world famous for his work on isotopes and using again these microscopic fossils in the ocean to work out the temperature of the ocean. But he's worked out the temperature of the ocean over the last 500 million years. His database is huge. His funding was incredible. He, he's got isotope readings for 25,000 fossils. And he found this pattern of uh, cold temperatures in the Ordovician, in the Permium and the Ice Age. And uh, he was wondering about this pattern. And then he went to a conference and he met this freak from Israel uh, near Shaviv. Uh, Shaviv's expertise is in meteorites and astrophysics. Uh, he did his bachelor's degree by the time he was 18. Even though he was in the Israeli army, by law you have to be, uh, he finished his PhD by the age of 21. Now he reckoned that every time that the solar system transits an arm of the Milky Way, we had basically an ice age. Uh, and inside that, of course, we have many, many ice ages. And then he and Weiser met at a conference one day and they realized they were looking at the same thing. So when they eventually published this paper, as Jan Weiser said to me in an email only last week, he went become, from being world famous to a pariah because he was not pushing the local popular IPCC uh, sermon. He wasn't publishing, he wasn't saying that CO2 was, he was saying was responsible for climate change, rising CO2. He was saying there are changes happening in the atmosphere, the cosmos is involved and the sun's magnetic field can vary the cosmic rays hitting the earth. So the sun's involved with the cosmos and there is some explanation for climate change there. So we've now got cosmic weather, solar weather, and local weather. So we're now getting near the end of this talk. And the question I'm asking all of you is, if I take some cycles that are real, can I project them in the future? I mean, the sun comes up every day. Can I therefore decide that it's going to come up tomorrow? Why can't I? Why can't I look at repetitive historical cycles and project them into the future? Well, what happens? This is a long cycle. This is a 100,000 year cycle. We now know from ice cores, we've got eight of them. So we can say that, oh gosh, between each of these ice ages, we had a, a spell of 15 to 30,000 years. So within that period, we're going to have another ice age and New York will have another two kilometers of ice on it. And human beings somehow are going to have to survive in the Northern hemisphere. And here in Australia, we'll be a lot happier. But looking at things in a shorter time frame, there are these 60 year cycles. Um, you can see them in the early IPC records. And uh, in that earlier diagram I showed you of the two warming gradients, we've actually got 30 years of warming, 30 years of going sideways or cooling, 30 years of rising, 30 years ago. So we've got this a 60 year cycle. 
We won't get it in the past because we don't have the resolution, except in some of the West Antarctic ice cores, we can see it in the, in the 1700s and 1800s. We can't see it in the main Arctic or Antarctic ice cores because the resolution, there's so little snowfall, the resolution is very poor. But here we've got a geophysicist, he's now retired from the University of Alaska, a Japanese geophysicist, Agu Sofu, and he's saying, well, if I take these 30 year periods, so it's 30 years going down, 30 years going up, it's a 60 year cycle and project them in the future, I'm going to end up with a cold period in the middle of this 20th, 21st century. That's what the sunspot cycles are saying too. And surely, uh, you know, there's some good reason behind this. Was, is the cycle going to be disrupted? Is the, is the cycle looks very real. He's onto something and a lot of people agree with him. If we look at the solar activity that I've talked about, can we look at this drop in sunspots that's happening at the moment? Oh, gosh, we're in cycle 25, but things are going down. There's hardly any sunspots. And if there's a lag between low sunspots and cooling, which the Russians say, we could be in for it in the next 20 years. Well, that's not very pleasant, is it? But what about the IPCC and this model story that we're heading to a warming catastrophe? So then we look at, to finish up, the failure of model lands. There are, mo there are prophets who've come out of model land and they look like fools, but people still believe the models. They say the models are fine. It looks personal if you have criticized these people, but their projections don't make any sense. The models were first started really in the 60s and uh, they, they're important. They do show some predictive tools. The genius behind the first climate computer models was Sakuri Manabe, a Japanese who'd come over to work in America and he ended up at Princeton. Uh, he was later joined by uh, Kirk Bryan and a man called Wetherill, and they then produced these very good climate models. But his computer had only 500k of gram. He could only make a model for a third of the Earth because he didn't have enough computing power. And when the American Academy of Science met in 79, and they were asked to discuss what would happen to the world's temperature if CO2 levels doubled, they looked at the models and they had Sakura's models, and they had James Hansen, he had been working on Venus. Now they thought, Hansen said four degrees, Manabi said 1.5. Oh, we've got a, what is called an equilibrium sensitivity index from 1.4 carbon dioxide levels doubled. And that's behind all the models still today. Uh, even in the uh, upcoming report in next year, it's the same thing. Um, we've got this, Increase in temperature if carbon dioxide levels double. And yet, as I've tried to show all through this talk, that link is pretty bad. It's not there. This, by the way, if you're looking at a more sophisticated model, the Hadley model today, there's thousands of these rooms. Each room talks to one another. There's rooms in the ocean, there's rooms in the atmosphere, but a room in the atmosphere near the equator could be nearly 30,000 cubic k's. And in that room, you can only put one reading for say cloud cover or your um, uh, rise in temperature uh, with altitude, things like that. But let us go and let us see the reality of model land. This is a model, uh, uh, this is a report of 102 models. It's what they've said since uh, about 1974, 75. They seem to agree with temperature for a while and then the red line, they go to blazes upwards. On the bottom, the blue is temperature data using uh, uh, microwaves uh, reacting with oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. But that uh, temperature record agrees very well with the balloon temperature record, which is green. So we've got real temperature data and we can see that after, you know, about 1998, the two sets diverse. Now, the, the bottom set's real. This is the real temperatures, balloon temperatures, uh, satellite temperatures in the, in, the, in the troposphere. 
And yet the models are on steroids. They fail. They're still believed. They're still used. And they're being used as predictive tools when even the IPC says they shouldn't be. Strangely enough, one of the most gung-ho climate institutions in the world is the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts in Germany, funded by um, Angela Merkel. One of their chief scientists only a few months ago said, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong with our models are running too hot. And that's actually sending a few shivers through climate science at the moment, because that person has been a big catastrophist. So concluding, look at all these prophets. Tim Flannery, who said, the rain that falls won't fill our dams. Attenborough, he can't stop producing doom and gloom. Al Gore, talking about if Arctic ice went, that would be a catastrophe. We know today it's not unprecedented. Prince Charles tells us one stage that we had 96 months to save the world. Peter Wadham's in the middle, row in the middle, uh, a great an Antarctic, uh, Arctic explorer, again, talking about loss of ice in the Arctic as if it's a catastrophe. In the middle row at the bottom, Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, who's now retired, who founded the Potsdam Institute of Climate Science. He thinks the seven tipping points, we're going to die. Uh, we need to disband national governments. We need the United Nations to take over. We need a world government with seven wise men. And this guy got into the Papal Academy of Science in Rome, which I'm ashamed of because I had been a Catholic priest. And um, he's been an advisor to the World Bank. And on the bottom left, of course, Hansen, who in 1988 uh, gave this famous talk to the US Senate Committee of the United States, and he predicted that Manhattan would be flooded in the 2020s. So wrong, and they lived in model land. How can we take the models seriously? And I end up with James Lovelock. James Lovelock made the Gaia hypothesis the, the, the whole earth was a sort of the whole earth and the universe was a living organism and we were going to a climate catastrophe and he was a hero of the climate movement but only a few years ago and john's now 100 but over 10 years ago 12 years ago he changed his mind he said look i've got to admit i'm wrong we're supposed to be halfway to a frying world by now and we're not so that's where we really are Climate science is on steroids. It's an absolute mess. It's not logical. It is not scientific. It is not empirical. It is not factual. So look, I thank you very much for listening to me. And Ross, I'll leave it to, to ask me some difficult questions, which I welcome. Um, I have written a book on this, Mirrors and Mazes, A Guide to the Climate Debate. And as I said before, my son and I have been working on a YouTube channel which we've still got a long way to go on it, but looking at individual scientists and their contributions to science that eventually has led to modern climate science. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Howard. That was great. Uh, great timing, and uh, you've pulled in a great audience. We've had about 80 people listening today, so I think that's a, a sign of, um, well... It's, it's a sign that the topic is very interesting and important. Um, I see that there's been a whole lot of uh, uh, comments left on the chat, uh, um, and I'll, I'll come to those in a moment. But for the time being, uh, the system is, if you would like to make a, a verbal comment uh, or ask a question, um, the way to do so is to raise your virtual hand. And the way that we do that is to find the icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I think, which is called Participants. If you click on that, then you should have the facility to raise your virtual hand. If you do that, then I will see you and I will um, uh, come to come to people in the order in which they raise their hand. In, in the meantime, while I'm waiting for people to uh, uh, raise their virtual hands. So I'm just going to see if I can uh, have a look at this uh, chat room because there's quite a lot of um, comments on here. Um, several of the, the earlier comments came from Michael Clark 
And I think basically, well, you can all see these comments, but basically I, I take it that Michael was uh, agreeing uh, with some of the things that um, Howard was saying about um, coastline shift and so on um, from his personal experience. Um, Michael, I invite you to put up your hand and, and ask a question if, you, if I haven't done you justice there. But uh, now we do have a couple of um, hands up. So let me go to the first one on the list, who is Alan Moran. I've tried to unmute you. You might need to unmute yourself at your end also, Alan. Hello, can't hear anything. Am I, okay. am I, yeah, um, yeah. The, the 102 different models, um, uh, as, as you would be aware, one of them actually tracks reality quite well. Uh, I, I believe it's a Russian one. Uh, could you could you confirm that uh, and and perhaps indicate what was different with that model's uh, uh, architecture from others? Uh, thanks, Alan. It's a very good question. Um, some people regard the Russian model as the best because uh, in the models, one of the things that's important is cloud cover and whether cloud cover is a positive or a negative influence. If clouds come over late in the day, they keep heat in. Uh, if they're there at the start of the day, they reflect heat out. So the amount of cloud cover seems pretty vital in the way you design a model. The Russians, uh, uh, some of the models um, have cloud cover as a positive factor and that causes the world to heat up more. But the Russian model have cloud cover as a negative. And so their correspondence with that balloon data and the satellite data is pretty good. And as far as I know, that's one of the best models around. And the Russians have been following this whole matter uh, on a internet called Astrometria. You can look it up, it's quite interesting. They do not believe that CO2 has got anything to do with the modern warming. Uh, and that's out of the Paul Kova Observatory uh, near St. Petersburg. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, let me now turn to the next person with a hand up. And that is, I, uh, I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly. It's Inga Hammer. And I'm trying to unmute you. You may have to do the same again. There we go. Go ahead, please. Hello. It's actually Michael Hammer. It's my, my wife's channel. Um, it seems to me there's a very simple way of proving or disproving global warming. The thesis of global warming specifically says rising CO2 causes warming by reducing Earth's energy loss to space. It further says that feedback from water vapour uh, as the world warms, more water vapour causes an even greater reduction in energy loss to space. Well, when we look at the energy loss to space as measured by satellites since 1985, it's been steadily rising, not falling, and has risen at exactly the rate you would predict from the amount of warming indicated in the satellite data. So just applying Stefan Boltzmann's law with about 60% uh, uh, emissivity. What that says is that the theory is disproven. There is absolutely no impact on rising, uh, of rising CO2 on Earth's energy loss to space. Therefore, the theory has no validity. Um, you're very correct. And that is what I showed that diagram from Will Happer. Um, that's called a high trans program. There's another program on looking at all these variations called uh, mod trans six. They're all saying the same thing. Uh, basically, CO2 has done its job probably by 150 parts per million or something, and after that, any increase doesn't make any difference. But then if you look at, um, I'm just trying to think of the name of the satellite, but if you look at the satellite uh, graphs from, of what's been escaping into space, you, you can see Nimbus that data? They, they, can, they can confirm the same thing. Yeah, the Nimbus data. The Nimbus, that's right. Yeah, but the, the point is that there, um, there is absolutely no correlation between OLR and CO2. That means that the warming, there has been warming, it must be caused by increasing absorbed solar radiation. And if you look at the uh, data on that, you'll see that there's very strong correlation with cloud cover. So what's happened is the earth has warmed 
because cloud cover has dropped from 69% to 66%. And that fits perfectly with the theory that is being modulated by cosmic rays. Yeah, well, that's why I'll talk to said that anyhow. You're just repeating what I already said. <laughs> well, that's good. We like to have agreement here. Okay, um, let's let's move on. The, the next person with a hand up is Phil. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name, Phil. Uh, in fact, people, since this is a, a group that doesn't hasn't been together before, if you do ask a question or make a comment, it might be useful to tell us where you're from uh, before you do so. So please, Phil, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes, indeed. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Phil Hershkowitz. I'm connecting from San Francisco. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation, Professor. Um, first, a comment and then a question. I just, my comment is I hope everyone has a chance to look at Jennifer Maharasi's new book, Climate Change the Facts 2020, an excellent review of the literature, highly recommended available at climatechangethefacts.org.au. The second part is in having discussions with my, how shall I say it, warmest friends, I often talk about the indications that the solar cycle tends to indicate we're going into a global cooling period. Would anyone care to place a bet on the date where it's just going to become so obvious that you can't really deny it anymore. I, I mean, I know that according to, um, what's her name? Professor Zarkovsky, uh, the Russian, sorry. Uh, Zarkova. Uh, Zarkova, yeah. Um, anywhere between 2025 and 2050. I mean, I say to people, well, I don't want to fight with you. You're all my friends. But at some point, it's going to be blaringly obvious, glaringly obvious that we're into a global cooling period is that going to be 2025, 2030, 2040? When are we going to see the evidence of that so I can kind of sit back smugly and say, see, I told you so, or sadly say, see, I told you so? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Phil, for your comments. Uh, that particular book, by the way, I've written a chapter in it on Antarctic climate. Oh, fantastic. Uh, That's the, fantastic. Uh, the second point is that I never mentioned Professor Zarkova, the Ukrainian um, solar physicist who now works out of uh, Northumberland in England, but she's done work saying there's actually two magnetic fields in the sun. The sun is various parts of the sun are spinning at different speeds and the friction between them generates uh, charged particles and magnetic fields. And she reckons that when they oppose each other, we get a cold period and she's come up with 200 year cycles and is predicting cooling by about starting now, but uh, pronounced 2040. Russians are also around 2040. Um, nature's such a uh, funny beast. Uh, I don't think uh, we can uh, predict it accurately. For example, if you look at all the um, ice ages we've had, and if we look at the interglacial periods between eight ice ages, the periods between them have varied from about 15 to 30,000 years. So I think there's still that non-linear sort of quirkiness in nature that uh, we won't be able to guess, but that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, let me move on now to Colin Barton. Um, sorry, let me just un unmute you. I've done that, yeah. thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. thanks, Howard, very much for your, your talk. Um, I just ask, uh, and uh, I just might give a bit of a background. I'm from Melbourne here, and I'm retired now, but uh, worked, uh, and in fact, did my PhD in uh, West Antarctica with plant fossils and uh, the rest of it. Anyway, that's a bit of background. Um, what I'd like to ask is, when are the reviews in the IPCC going to be reflected in the summary for policymakers, because frankly, they seem to me to be two entirely different uh, uh, presentations. Uh, that's very true. Um, I'm an accredited IPC reviewer. I've only been that for a year and a bit, and it's only for this present one that's coming out next year, but there's a lot of incredibly good material in the IPC reports. But when 
some little committee gets together and writes the summary, um, the summary can often bear very little relationship to some of the material in the reports themselves. And I, I totally agree with you, and I don't know when it will happen. Uh, with regard to the Equilibrium Climate Sensitivity Index, uh, which is actually critical to climate science, probably one of the most critical things uh, around, uh, it would seem in the 2021 report there hasn't been a great improvement. Uh, I've signed a confidentiality agreement, but there's been various reports on uh, sites um, who reported on that in the coming report and they're not brilliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Colin, for your uh, comment. Um, I've run out of people with their virtual hands up, um, but there are quite a lot of people who have uh, put questions or comments in the chat. It's a bit too many to, to go through one by one. So I'm just going to sort of scan down and, and pick out a few names and invite people if they would like to do so to, um, to make a, a verbal comment. Uh, um, one name that I see here is Tim Walshaw. Are you there, Tim? And if so, would you like to say something? Or maybe he's, no, you're still there. Um, I was going to do it. Okay. Yeah, uh, you're, you're there and you're, you're, we hear you. If you would like to, to okay, well, voice okay. some of your uh, thoughts. Well, thanks for responding to me. Uh, my constant um, uh, attempt to... Uh, uh, on this uh, global warming thing, he's trying to get everybody to concentrate on a single theory. Now, I keep plugging the Milankovic uh, D. Rop uh, uh, theory, which you may be aware of, is uh, that global warming and cooling and ice ages is caused by wobbles in the Earth's axis. And uh, these are in turn, in turn caused by influences of Jupiter and Saturn on Earth. And locally, the moon for the 60 year derop cycle. Now, I've looked at all the other possible theories, including the solar radiation theories, and really they have no predictive capacity whatsoever because their cycles are totally. Uh, out of sync with changes in temperatures. So really, I, my aim in life is to try to get everybody to concentrate on the Milankovitch and Duroc cycles and stop this cloud cover, uh, solar cycles and so on, and get rail. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, I disagree with you. I think you're correct about the cycles due to Jupiter, Saturn, uh, probably the moon. Um, you talk about wobbles, but the Milankovitch's 100,000 year cycle is not wobbles, it's changes in the length of the uh, uh, ellipse. Well, the whatever, yes, yeah. I'm just trying to simplify it for the- Well, you're not. The and the 41,000 year cycle is a wobble in the tilt of the earth uh, every 41,000 years. And they are there, but there's also very hard to deny a cold period, say, between 1650 and when there were no sunspots. <clears throat> and uh, similarly, the Dalton minimum between 1795 and 1825. So I, I agree with part of what you're saying, but I just think there's a lot of added things that uh, can't be denied that are adding to the complexity of the whole matter. And uh, when it comes to the nonlinear theories that were first proposed by uh, Lorenz with his famous um, article on uh, uh, non-periodic deterministic flow. Lorenz's problem was that in nature, you can have the same identical situations, two of them, and yet the outcomes in, in both cases can be different. In other words, you can have different outcomes from the same identical uh, beginning. And, and that is something that's mind blowing and has been puzzling mathematicians and 
probability theorists ever since. Anyhow, but thank you very much, Tim, for your comment. I, I think some of the stuff you say is right, but I think there's a few other complications around. Quite possibly. <laughs> okay, it sounds like you guys have a lot more to talk about uh, together in the future. Um, another person who's made a few contributions on the, um, the chat is um, Peter Flood. Now he seems to have disappeared. He's, um, yes, I, I can't see him anymore. So uh, okay. Peter Flood was the Pro Vice Chancellor at New England University and head of yeah. the Geology Pub for many years. He's now Honorary Emeritus at Sydney Uni. Okay. Um, he, he was on the list a little while ago, but he, he might have uh, left the meeting, I think. Let me then go to uh, my colleague, Ronald Duncan. Yeah. Hi, thanks very much for the presentation. I'm uh, an Emeritus Professor at the Crawford School, an economist. I was at the World Bank for a, quite a while and did a lot of long-term uh, time series analysis of commodity prices. Uh, and so I've got a, an appreciation of how difficult it is to get a, a, a significant time series trend uh, when there's a lot of noise in the data. And uh, I had started with a friend doing some analysis of, of uh, the relationship between CO2 and temperatures in Australia and then was very upset to find out that uh, all this homogenization of the earlier data had gone on that now led, led to uh, an increased trend in, in the uh, Australian data. And as, uh, as a, uh, an analyst doing uh, uh, time series or whatever data analysis, it's really upsetting to uh, have people uh, changing the data uh, for whatever uh, reason. And so I was just wondering if you've got any views about what we can do about uh, the Australian long-term uh, uh, time series data on, on temperature. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Oh, look, I don't know, Dr. Duncan. Um, when uh, Willie Sen and the Connollys did that data on rural and urban temperatures for China, Ireland, USA, they even did the Arctic. Uh, I think Willie Soon's opinion was that the Southern, Hem uh, Southern Hemisphere temperature records were not that brilliant. They weren't as detailed uh, for analysis. And uh, uh, I don't know whether there's enough Australian data to produce a very good rural data set. There could be. And uh, there is a man at Port Macquarie, who's a statistician, Dr. Johnson, who could do that. But I think we really need to separate out Australian rural data from urban and see, yes, yes. If, and see if there's anything happening. The other thing I would say is that is it is a presumption to say that the, type, the global warming has been absolutely identical in the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. In the Southern Hemispheres, there's a lot more water. And where there's a lot more water, uh, it's like a dampening influence on temperature changes. So I suspect that the Southern Hemisphere database in terms of global warming is a bit more muted than the Northern Hemisphere one. But again, I'd love to see someone uh, do it and do it properly. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much for your comment, Dr. Duncan. Thanks, Ron. Um, the next person on my list uh goes by the name of vic 78 wd i don't know what your real name is but please go ahead and perhaps introduce yourself yes um my name is roy france i'm uh, work for a, a government uh, uh geological survey um the comment i'd like to make to dr brady is um you know uh, to say that perhaps um as part of this ongoing tussle if you like between uh, people saying it's cooling and people saying it's uh, it's warming is that we could turn the increase in co2 into a virtue um, your graph of the phanerozoic if nothing else shows that as m most geologists do, do know that the co2 has been steadily decreasing throughout the phanerozoic to the present day um, obviously because of the loss of um, carbonate now you know, carbonate definite um, deposition 
uh, some of the reading I've done suggested that during the last ice age, um, CO2 levels uh, dipped down to getting very close to initial plant death. Yeah, that we are, and uh, fortunately, uh, it went up again. The oceans degassed, and we've uh, come back up to a few hundred ppm. Um, the comment I'd like to make is that perhaps we should be making more of a song and dance to say, look, increased CO2 is giving us more of a, uh, if you like, a safety margin against worldwide plant death. And indeed, the recent greening of the planet as demonstrated through NASA satellites may underscore this. Um, mm. As I said, right. just trying to um, say, turn this into a virtue to say, you know, it's not all bad. Look, that's so true. Uh, I belong to a group out of Princeton called the CO2 Coalition. And there's been some very good papers written on this very point recently, one of them by Dr. Moore. Uh, he was one of the original founders of Greenpeace when they were anti-nuclear, anti-wales, but he left Greenpeace when they got into climate. But he's written a very good paper uh, relating uh, CO2 levels and vegetation. Uh, we had that huge uh, period of coal production in the Carboniferous. Uh, CO2 levels were taken out of the. But when those gymnosperms evolved, they had a holiday. There was so much CO2 in the air. So that I agree that increasing CO2 will be helpful to the earth. It will be helpful to our agricultural production. And uh, uh, if you email me, I will try to dig up Dr. Moore's paper on that very point. Yeah, I would um, just like, you know, again, to say that we're all worrying about the imaginary um, sort of fox in front of us and ignoring the, uh, the uh, sort of plant death bear behind us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, comment. Um, let me go now to my colleague, Jeff Bennett. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Ross, and thanks, Howard, for your presentation. Uh, I'm also Emeritus Professor at Crawford in Economics, so uh, the climate science is a little beyond me. But I am very interested now, Howard, that you're inside the IPCC tent as a reviewer and interested to hear your views on what role you think you can play in, in that position and whether or not there is hope for the IPCC to produce uh, um, a somewhat different picture to the one that they have been presenting. That's a good question, Jeff. At the moment, I think no, no hope. But um, if things cool or something goes wrong, then I think that's what we need to shock everyone into realising there's a problem. Uh, in terms of making a contribution to the IPCC, I think someone like myself has to say, well, wait a minute, what could be achievable and why, why waste your time writing a thousand pages criticising everything? What I've tried to do is to make submissions that we need to put up that satellite I mentioned before to reconcile the difference between time gauges and the satellite sea level rise. My view is that if we do that, then uh, a lot of things will fall into place. For example, a lot of talk is made about the melting of the ice caps. But if it's so dramatic as Al Gore and others say, we should be able to pick that up in the tide gauge data, which we don't. And <coughs> if we can then reconcile the tide gauge data and the satellite data, we should be able to pick it up in both data sets. And that should mute all of uh, calm down model land. So my attitude in being a reviewer is just to make a one simple submission and not to pretend to be an expert on everything, which I'm not, and to try to work politically at achieving one goal. But I agree with everything that you've said, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter Somerville was with us before, but I think he may have left the meeting, but he, he has okay. left. The, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Okay, well, please go ahead. Uh, I, I, I noticed one of your comments down towards the, the end of all of the comments that have come in on the chat room. Would you like to expand on that, perhaps, Peter? Well, for the interest of the others, I live in Melbourne. Um, my speciality, I suppose, is metrology, which is the science of measurement. And I just want to make a point that um, we are trying to measure variation over what is not a homogeneous system. It's very heterogeneous. 
with beta varying all over the place with huge ranges and swings and teasing out of that what are really very, very small changes. And that remains an issue. Um, I spent some time looking at the satellite data at one stage and it was quite clear to me that the satellite data, the, the instruments in the satellites weren't consistent with each other. There was variation between them. And I know they try to correct for this sort of stuff, but um, it is a fundamental problem until you get a sampling system, which is much more um, representative of the body you try to sample. And that's the big problem. Uh, I could comment a little bit on that. Uh, there's obviously resolution problems with regard to satellites, with regard to sea level, which has been acknowledged now by NASA. With regard to the radiation leaving the Earth, they put up these instruments um, to measure radiation, but they they don't last long. They have a lot of deterioration problems, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the 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 errors in them are nearly a could onto a few watts, which is enough to wreck the whole debate. And uh, I, I, I think there's, uh, it's in my book about those uh, meters, uh, but there's a, that's a pretty critical problem. And I think this Peter's problem uh, about some of this measuring data is, is right. I mean, how are our measurements even of the radiation going into space? If we've got an error of a couple of watts, uh, that's, that's huge. So thank you very much. Thanks, Howard. Okay, thanks. Um, there is also an interesting comment in the chat from Rick Will. Uh, Rick, if you're there and if you'd like to uh, expand on your point, that might be good for us all. Can you unmute yourself? Hello, Rick. That doesn't seem to be working. Oh, there we go. Are you there? No, I think he's just left us. I've scared him off. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're just about out of people with the, uh, out of people with the hand up, but um, I, I think both uh, Colin Barton and Inga Hammer, who is not Inga Hammer, um, both may still have something additional that they would like to add. So, Colin, can I ask you? Did you, did you have an extra point to make? I'll make one that might be a little bit frivolous, but uh, never mind. I mean, we've had a wonderful discussion and it's been really great to listen to everyone. I know as a geologist and I travel around and I look at the country, uh, if only the general population, the school children were, were taught to look at what they see in related to climate, it would all be so obvious, but they're not getting taught that in school. And uh, that's a shame. And I made a, a thing about a, a, a frivolous comment. You made, uh, Howard, in your, in your, at the end of your talk, you made a comment about uh, the Truman Show where the guy Truman Burbank was living in, a, a mis in an imaginary world and likened it to how we are living in and not being able to look at all of the heterogeneous mixes that go to make up climate. Mm -hmm. There's a better one in uh, an earlier one that's uh, perhaps even better than that. It's called The Prisoner, where Patrick McGowan was locked in a, in, a, in a village that looked absolutely normal until one day he got to the wall, looked outside, and he's in the middle of a huge desert. And that's what we're kind of living in now, uh, yeah. that uh, people don't have the skills or the inclinations, and they've been brainwashed into... Uh, into accepting uh, a world that's not real. It's almost like a virtual world where you're ignoring the real empirical data. And that's what most, that's what geologists look at, look at what's happened and how to see it and history, geological history too. It does repeat itself in cycles. Yes, um, I, I, your point about children is so, true, uh, how do you get to science teachers in school whose knowledge of climate is probably pretty poor and then get to the children? <clears throat> when I taught years ago at Chevalier College Barrel, I was lucky because in that Holocene thermal maximum period, which is much warmer than today, you had rainforests that went down to Maria, but you also had that big swamp out near Burrowing 
And I used to be able to take the, my students out there and say, look, the world was warmer 8,000 years ago. And here it is. This was a, this swamp, this peat swamp was formed then. And, and it's not, we're not as warm as that today. So the field work was able to do that, but I was lucky having something like that nearby. And I had the opportunity to take students out there, but I don't know how you get through to students today. I know that uh, one recently had a debate about that uh, in a chat room. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I was busy that day to join it, but I, I'd hate to think what happened. And the other big problem is, as a Catholic, the Pontifical Academy of Science uh, through the last two popes has been a disaster. I had an email from Jan Weiser, who we mentioned before with his isotope work. He and 10 scientists went to the Papal Academy a few years ago. Only the IPC geologists were allowed to speak. And that was a, an academy that was set up to mimic the Academy of the Lynxes, set up by an Italian count in 1603, where a lynx was supposed to have good eyesight and you had to have the guts to describe what you see. And the academy had to be open to anyone, atheists, agnostics, Catholics, Buddhists, you name it. And a lot of the top scientists were invited when it started. But the tradition of that academy that was reset up by Pius XI uh, in the 30s, that tradition has been very badly lost in the Catholic Church. Uh, thanks, thanks very much uh, for that extra bit, Colin. Um, I, I noticed there's a, a, a chat item from Rick Will, who I invited just a moment ago, and apparently he doesn't have access to a microphone. So um, let me just take this opportunity to say to everybody that the group chat, uh, you can easily copy all of that um, and just just uh, keep a record of it. Uh, and if there are interesting points, questions, whatever that you uh, want to follow up on, um, uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, but I think after the session is closed, that chat will disappear. So this would be a good uh, chance for you to do control A and copy all of that stuff that's in the chat. Um, we're we're over time now there's still a lot of people with us um almost 70 people still with us so i'm quite um prepared to to let this run on for a little while more please nobody feel obliged to stick around but if, if you would uh like to continue this conversation with uh howard then um, um Ross, I, I, might say something. Uh, I forgot to put in my paper all this material about the acidification of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Now the ocean has never been acid in its whole history. And uh, there's a very good periodical brought out by uh, the Centre for the, uh, the Sea from Oxford, where about 20 scientists wrote about this acidification problem. And basically the ocean's always been alkaline. Um, sometimes if there's high CO2 levels, it drops a bit, but it's always been alkaline. And um, that periodical, uh, I'm just trying to work out where it came from. Um, just wait a second. Um, oh dear. It was the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And the article, the, the whole periodical on that one topic was in 2016. So if people look up that periodical, I'll see a whole series of lectures on that problem. And one of the big problems is that the sea is a very gentle place. It doesn't change much. Animals that live in there don't live with our range of temperatures. I get up in the morning, it's minus six in Canberra. And during the day, it might be 20. If I'm in the ocean, I'll have to live with changes of only bits of a degree. So if you try to do experiments in a laboratory, uh, on acidification or making changes to organisms and run your experiment for two weeks. What organism is hurt? It's not used to changes that quickly, but in history, barrier reefs and everything have adjusted to slightly different changes in seawater and it's not a problem. So I just, I didn't put that in my paper, but maybe I should have, but I'd like, I'll make that comment now. 
Like I think people have probably got your email address or your uh, your website URL, and so they can contact you and yeah, they're very uh, welcome to you write another paper and uh, flesh okay. out the point for us. Okay, <laughs> uh, um, Ross, I have to go, and uh, and so thank you, Ross, and thank you, Howard, very much for a fantastic uh, uh, as what you call it on Zoom. I've enjoyed it a lot. And so bye to everyone, and thanks again. Thank thanks you. for being with us, Colin. There's, there's still a couple of uh, people who um, still have their hands up. Uh, I, I'm not sure, Professor Hammer, are you still there? And did you want to say anything? Yes, more? I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah. This, you asked for some background. I'm now retired, but I spent about 40 years doing research for a multinational spectroscopy company. Mm -hmm. so I've got some understanding of the spectroscopy. One of the things that one hears often is that if the Earth didn't have any greenhouse gases, it'd be 33 degrees cooler. This is absolute rubbish, the, but it's a really interesting philosophical point because if you look at it, the atmosphere clearly does mechanical work. It raises water to high levels, it generates winds, and the energy for that comes from the sun, which means that the atmosphere is a classical heat engine, no different to a steam engine. And that means it must obey Carnot's laws, which means it must have a hot junction, which is clearly the surface of the earth in the tropics, but it must also have a cold junction where energy leaves the working fluid, the atmosphere. There are only two candidates for that. One is the poles and the other one is the tropopause. And it's easy to show that the poles are not a real candidate. It's not possible. The, cool, the cold junction has to be the tropopause. But if there were no greenhouse gases, there would be no way for the tropopause to lose energy to space, which means the heat engine would collapse which means there'd be no weather, there'd be no rain, there'd be no clouds, there'd be no winds. Um, and far from being colder, in the tropics at noon, the surface temperature would reach 100 degrees centigrade. And even here where I'm in Melbourne, um, in the middle of summer uh, at noon, you'd get over 60 degrees. And in fact, we see exactly that uh, in a closed car where children die because they're left in a closed car, the temperature reaches 60 plus degrees and it kills them. There'd be no convection. So if it wasn't for greenhouse gases, there'd be no climate. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hammer. Um, I think when um, Fourier looked at the problem, he was considering planets that didn't have an atmosphere at all. What you're looking at is a atmosphere that had oxygen and nitrogen, but none of the greenhouse gases. Yes. Okay, and uh, Jeff, do you still have your hand up? Yes, I do, Ross. I just wanted to say thank you for um, chairing uh, this session. It's been very, very constructive and useful. Uh, as I said, I'm an economist, and I think uh, a lot of policy uh, advised by economists is being based on a notion of certain climate change as a result of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think, if anything, this seminar has showed that there's considerable uncertainty about the future of the climate, and we should be thinking in terms of policy uh, in those terms rather than in terms of certainty. Some would argue that we need to um, uh, put in place policies that represent the precautionary principle. You know, something terrible might happen in the future, so we should do something about it. Uh, my argument there is that um, should we keep on the track of the sorts of policies we're pursuing at the moment, uh, we're also going to suffer from potential uh, risk associated with uh, considerable declines in our prosperity, hence our ability to um, achieve social welfare and personal gains. So thanks, Ross, for persisting uh, with, this, with this seminar and from an economist's perspective. And thank you, Howard, for your uh, insightful presentation. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh the precautionary principle has to be based on models or that are right. If these models are on steroids, they hardly can be used for precautionary action. But if we are going to be precautionary, as I said in my book, we should be having looking at the possibility of some cooling that may affect our agriculture. Especially uh, okay. CO2 may be going up, but there are some belts that are very sensitive to climate change like the wheat fields in Canada, Belarus and the Ukraine. Um, if the world cooled, uh, then we may be looking for uh, wheat belts and et cetera at places that are closer to the uh, equator than they are. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Jeff, for those kind comments. Um, we still have a couple of uh, other people who would like to have uh, another word. Uh, Alan Moran, please. Oh, hi, thanks. And, and yeah, thanks very much for a terrific talk. Uh, just by way of background, I'm also an economist uh, and uh, actually edited and contributed to the very first uh, Climate Change, the Facts book, which uh, the latest one has just come out. Um, but I think uh, one of the interesting things in, in trying to debunk the, these myths is to try to use ridicule. And Howard, you sort of tipped your toe in there a little bit by drawing on Al Gore, et cetera, and what they'd said and what the outcomes were. I wonder whether you've got any, anything of a compendium of those, uh, of those statements and, and how wrong they've been that, we can, that you could share with us. Not really, Alan. I, on my climate file on my computer, which is huge, I do have a, a folder for those sort of things, but I've, I've never collected them all. I mean, some of them are the famous guy in England who said that our children will never know snow anymore. The, the stacks of them, but I'm afraid I haven't collected them. Uh, okay. I think there would be someone around who has, but I haven't. I've had a go at some of them, but I thought it'd be something. Mine isn't complete either. I thought you may have had No, to. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Professor Wadhams at one stage thought that three climate scientists who were warmest in England were murdered. Uh, there was someone working at Oxford who, riding a bicycle one day, was killed. Another bloke fell down a staircase or something. And... Wadham thought that the skeptics were murdering some of the, well, I mean, some of the conspiracy stuff is quite remarkable. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, let's go for one final word from Phil. Hi, thank you so much for uh, taking my question and for the excellent discussion. Um, equilibrium, I wanted to talk about equilibrium. I know this comes up a lot in the discussion of the earth and its climate that if there was if there were runaway effects, well, they would have happened sometime in the last billion years and we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Doesn't doesn't it make sense? And again, as a layman, I ask this, doesn't it make sense that the earth, the environment, the climate tends towards equilibrium? It gets a bit hot, mechanisms are in effect. To cool it a bit, it gets too cold. Mechanisms are in place to heat it a bit. Don't we tend towards that sort of muddle through middle in the world, and I'm open to any opinions or feedback about yeah, that. From I, I, the, I totally uh, agree. And this was Lorenz's whole point uh, with his discussion about non uh, A lot of people thought he's talking about complete chaos. He wasn't. He was saying in a system there are boundaries, and the system doesn't go out. But inside those boundaries, it's chaotic, and, and it's hard to know exactly what's happening. But when the system gets near one of the boundaries, it bounces off it. So that if we look at uh, Earth history, what well, we may have got to some boundary, like really low CO2 levels, I reckon they'll bounce up. The, the, there is this sort of thing happening. And I think Lorenz had it right when he started to talk about stability within boundaries, even though uh, there was a lot of uncertainty with the exact changes within boundaries. And uh, I tried to describe that in my book, uh, in my I'm not a physicist, but in the language that I could use as best as possible. But thank you. Okay. Well, I think, uh, as I say, we're, we're well over time now, so I think we might call the session to a close here. Uh, I'd just like to thank, well, Howard in particular for putting a lot of work into uh, making this presentation for us. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that such a large number of people have uh, given... presentation. I, I confess that I was a little bit slow to press the start button so that the first minute or two might be missing, um, but that will become available. Uh, I've never actually done this before, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure uh, the process that goes through, but uh, I've given my email address in the chat. And so you can, you can write to me if you're keen to get a uh, hold of that uh, uh, re recording and I'll, I'll make sure that you get it. Uh, I don't think it becomes available immediately, but perhaps within a day or two. Um, for those of you who would like to have a copy of Howard's paper underlying this presentation, again, if you, if you don't have that already, please write to me and request it. Um, 
and I'll either send it to you or send the message on to Howard and he can handle it. I think that's about um, all I have to say. Uh, so thanks very much once again. It's, it's been a great experience. Um, I think there's a lot of food for thought here and uh, well, I hope uh, lots. Of, uh, I hope all of you who um, find this interesting will uh, take whatever opportunity to, you have to uh, spread the message that climate science is not yet settled. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. We'll Thank you, see Russ. you again sometime.